Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the 100 Minutes of Hematology, where blood cells turn against us. Uh, I'm Dr. Chong Mian from the Department of Hematology, and um, I'm just very happy to welcome all of you to spend this uh, 100 minutes with us. So to kick things off, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Ng Hing Ju, who is our Department HOD, to give you an introduction. Dr. Ng, please. Thank you, Mayan, uh, for the introduction. Uh, first of all, I'd like to wish everybody a very warm uh, good afternoon uh, to you. Thank you for taking your Saturday afternoon uh, to spend time with us on this uh, forum entitled 100 Minutes uh, of uh, Hematological Disorders. Um, this public forum is uh, made possible uh, by the kind efforts of our patient liaison uh, office working together with the department uh, uh, mainly through the efforts of uh, Dr. Tehu Yimin, who is with us here today. And it's also held in conjunction with the 200th anniversary of uh, Singapore General uh, Hospital. The Department of Hematology itself uh, was uh, first started in Singapore General Hospital in 1985, so we are more than 30 years old uh, now. And we currently have a team of 29 hematologists, or as we call ourselves, uh, blood specialists uh, in the department. Uh, subspecializing in more than 10 subspecialties, uh, ranging from blood clotting disorders all the way to stem cell uh, transplants. So the department is currently the oldest and the biggest hematology uh, unit in uh, Singapore. And we see a comprehensive range of uh, disorders uh, from uh, the very simple uh, low blood counts or low blood counts uh, all the way to more complicated conditions that are treated with state-of-the-art um, therapeutic uh, options like stem cell transplants and more uh, recently uh, CAR T-cell transplants that you may uh, or CAR T-cell therapy that you may have uh, uh, heard of. So it's, simply, it's certainly our pleasure to be uh, able to come forth this afternoon uh, to spend time uh, over the next 100 minutes or so uh, to share with you uh, certain conditions that we have uh, picked that may be of interest uh, to the uh, audience. As it may seem, um, unlike uh, more common conditions like high blood pressure or diabetes, uh, blood disorders are perhaps what we would call a little bit more esoteric. Uh, and many a times uh, when um, a, a person is uh, told that they may potentially have a blood disorders, it brings on a lot of uncertainties, uh, concerns, um, and also worries about what the blood, that blood condition is. And largely because uh, blood disorders are not the most uh, common of course in the public spheres. In fact, many people do not recognize uh, blood as an organ like the kidney or the lung or the heart. But in fact, uh, blood cells and the uh, proteins that are found in blood is just like any organ in the human body because it has a function in carrying oxygen by way of the red cells. Uh, it has a function of protecting us against infections uh, by way of the white blood cells. And of course, it helps to prevent uh, bleeding uh, when we have injuries and so on uh, through the, um, the function of another kind of blood cells called platelets, as well as the proteins that are found uh, within blood. So we certainly appreciate this uh, opportunity for uh, us to join together with you uh, and uh, through a series of four talks given by my colleagues uh, from the department uh, this afternoon. We hope to uh, enlighten you on some of the conditions that you may have come across uh, that are of interest to you. Uh, and where possible, we hope to be able to provide insights into these conditions that we'll be talking about, uh, clarify questions that you may have early concerns that um, may have uh, bugged you, and more importantly, uh, um, most importantly of all, ensure that there is some uh, um, uh, um, a concerted effort on our part to clarify and to ensure that there is a better understanding of blood disorders uh, that you may have come across or that you may currently be uh, experiencing. So I hope that you will um, uh, spend a fruitful uh, afternoon uh, with us through this uh, series of uh, four talks to be given by my colleagues. And the first of the four talks this afternoon will be presented to you uh, by uh, my colleague, that is uh, Dr. Uh, Chong Mei En. Uh, her topic today will be on blood conditions that causes miscarriages. What are they? 
and what can be done. Dr. Cheong is an associate consultant in the Department of uh, Hematology, one of our young and upcoming uh, uh, blood specialists in the department with a special interest in thrombotic conditions or conditions that causes uh, blood clots as well as uh, bleeding. So over to you, May Anne, for the first talk of this afternoon. Thank you so much, Dr. Ng, for that kind introduction. Um, just want to make sure that everybody can hear us. I think there are some people in the chat that are saying that uh, it's a bit soft. So is this good enough? Maybe somebody can say aye aye on the chat. <laughs> All right, just give me a moment for me to share screen. All right, just uh, give me a moment. I think there's a little bit of an issue here. All right, are you able to see my screen now? Okay, let's go to the front. All right, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you can see the screen nicely. Uh, yeah, so as Dr. Ng mentioned, I'm Mian, I'm from the Department of Hematology here at Singapore General Hospital, and I've been tasked with the next 20 minutes to share with you about blood condition that causes miscarriages, uh, what they are, and what can be done about it. So I think the first thing to, to really note is that miscarriages are really, really, really common, and many ladies do unfortunately experience this. And although it's common, it's never easy. And one of the common questions that uh, we get as doctors is uh, why did I have a miscarriage? Is it me? Is it something that I did? Is it something in my body? What is wrong? And I think firstly to understand miscarriages is to really understand what pregnancy is about and the pregnancy process. So uh, just indulge me in the next uh, one or two minutes. And I take this knowledge from my husband who is also a gynecologist, so he has bettered this. So really at the beginning of things, uh, the egg meets the sperm and fertilization occurs, but that's only the start. The next thing the, this fusion needs to do is really to get into the womb itself and implant so that it can start dividing and growing. And then from a ball of cells in the first trimester, it starts forming into something that looks like a little human and the growth develops. And this growth is really fueled by mummy's blood and mummy's nutrition. And this is where the blood supply is essential. Uh, the placenta is the organ that really is amalgamation of a lot of blood vessels that connects mummy to baby through the umbilical cord. This whole process takes about nine months and at the end of the nine months, we hope to get a healthy baby. But along this process, we know sometimes, unfortunately, things don't really go out as planned. And this is the pyramid of um, pregnancy losses. And what really happens is that actually a lot of pregnancy losses happens even before one may even know that they are pregnant. And that's why we really realize that miscarriages are actually more often and more common than what we think. And a lot of us are not alone in this. So um, in the preclinical stage, I mean preclinical means before even a doctor can uh, pick up that you're pregnant, a lot of the eggs that meet the sperm don't end up in the womb and they don't implant. And this is up to 30% of cases, in fact. And after implantation, another 30% don't actually divide and grow very well. And sometimes this may occur where Initially, you may have a urine pregnancy test that is positive and subsequently becomes negative. Uh, and when the doctor does an ultrasound, they don't really see anything in the womb. Subsequently, after that, when you go for your visits with your gynae, you may actually pick up a heartbeat, pick up a, a baby inside the uter in the womb, and then things develop. But unfortunately, even when you reach the clinical stage, um, 10% and already if you realize you're already the tip of the iceberg and only 40% of uh, pregnancies actually reach this stage. 
So one out of four will still end up in a miscarriage. And this uh, is very heartbreaking usually, but it's mean due to many, many different causes. And uh, what are these causes? So really a multitude of different factors are in place uh, from genetic conditions. And this is fairly common where um, there are abnormalities in the genes that basically results in the fetus not developing properly and not having the essential genetic code to develop into a healthy baby and hence um, they don't develop further and a miscarriage happens. So in that sense, sometimes it's how nature sort of um, limits the growth uh, of a, otherwise some uh, fetus that will be unhealthy. Uh, there are also physical causes more or less in the womb where, for example, if you have a fibroid, which is a non-cancerous growth in the womb and fibroids are very common, it disrupts the anatomy, the structure of the womb, and this can result in difficulty in implantation of the uh, embryo as well as growth of the fetus inside the womb, and this can also result in miscarriages. There are also other factors regarding um, your hormones, for example, so having some thyroid problems or even more commonly diabetes now is quite common, uh, can also lead to uh, pregnancy losses. Well, blood conditions are actually not that common a cause of pregnancy loss, but it's something that if it's present, we can address. But really, when you address uh, pregnancy loss, we always start from the beginning, reviewing the patient. And this is more likely done by the gynecologist. We don't come in that early. So really, if somebody is experiencing um, multiple pregnancy losses, usually what the gynees will do is that they will take a thorough medical evaluation. They will talk to you as well as your partner to ask about past pregnancies, what your periods has been like. You know, do you have any other medical conditions? They will usually do a physical examination as well, especially uh, checking the size of the womb. And most gynees will also do an ultrasound scan where they can evaluate for structural abnormalities of the womb and look out for things like fibroids. Um, then subsequently, targeted blood investigations can be done and they may do some things regards to hormone levels such as uh, screening for diabetes as well as um, screening for thyroid. And sometimes they may do some um, investigations that are related to the blood disorders and that's where we come in. So most of the time we get referred from the gynecologist uh, and most of the times it's because of some abnormal uh, blood test that they suspect a blood condition. So what do we actually do as a hematologist or blood doctors in the um, addressing miscarriages? So uh, really a lot of the times um, the conditions are more tended towards clotting disorders and we usually will follow up based on um, what the gynae has referred to us, do further investigations, um, take the history once again, and then work it up from there. So I think in terms of issues of bleeding and clotting, and like I mentioned, most of the time, um, pregnancy losses may be resulted more in clotting disorders. It's really a balance. It's a bit of yin and yang. Uh, when things are out of balance, then problems occur. So in a way, when addressing um, pregnancy losses and with clotting, it's actually just because this balance is tipped more towards clotting and we can uh, treat by sort of reinstating that balance so that uh, pregnancy can be successful. So some of my patients, uh, you know, they ask, you know, why is my blood so thick? Why do I clot so much? You know, can my blood just stop clotting? Um, but I always remind them that this is an essential part of existence because if any of you uh, have a kitchen incident and I just had one when I grated off the pulp of my finger, we need our blood to clot. Otherwise, if it doesn't clot, we also lead into other problems of bleeding. Um, and that's why it's really just about the balancing act. Um, and I hope nobody has to go through what I went through because I was pressing my finger for one hour. I needed my husband to put some tissue glue on it to stop the bleeding. And this is the time when you realize that, hey, I do want my blood to clot. So what is the problems of clotting then? Well, when the balance is tipped towards clotting, what happens is that you have blood 
formation within the blood vessels. Uh, and these are the blood vessels, especially in the placenta and in the umbilical cord that feeds the developing baby. And this structure you know, provides oxygen, it provides nutrients to the growing baby and also removes waste material from the baby's blood. So it's extremely important. So what actually happens within the blood vessels? So, you know, usually your blood flow when your red blood cells, your white blood cells and your platelets are flowing very nicely in harmony. But sometimes what happens is that because of certain factors, it causes the blood cells to start sticking together. And you realize it forms a traffic jam. And not only does that actually have a physical clot there, it also impedes the flow of blood. And hence, you know, it will basically result in a restriction of blood flow to the eventual receiver. And in this case, it's the growing baby. So there are many uh, different causes uh, that increases the tendency to clot. And, uh, you know, sometimes doctors, we classify it as genetic or acquired just to uh, take away the, the medicalization of terms. It's really a, something of like nature versus nurture where uh, no nature causes are conditions that are due to abnormalities in your genes. So for example, we have protein C and protein S deficiency and pro thrombin gene mutation. But I would say genetic causes tend to be in its rarity. And usually we may not screen for it say, for example, in the absence of a very robust family history or say, for example, certain things in your medical uh, development that, you know, will raise alarm bells for genetic conditions. Conditions also can happen after uh, your genes are set. So that's nurture. Um, and these are like antiphospholipid syndrome as well as myeloprolytic disorders where the bone marrow decides to produce too much cells and hence uh, there's a tendency to clot. Now, I just wanted to cover a little bit about blood testing because a lot of times we receive our patients as a referral from our gynecologist, for example. And I would say the first thing with regards to testing for clotting disorders related to miscarriages, there's no really a fixed menu to this. Um, it's really individualized. Um, as mentioned, you know, certain conditions are extremely rare. It may not be that uh, prudent to just do a, a random screening for anybody. Um, it may not be very high yield. There are also circumstances where the timing of the investigation is extremely important. So I just want to really introduce the notion of false positive or negatives, which I think uh, many of you may be familiar with because hearing the terms out, especially in, in COVID testing situations. So for example, um, you know, we are afraid of false negatives because that means the patient condition is really there, but because of the circumstances of testing, um, it proves to be negative. So to just draw an analogy, for example, if you do a urine pregnancy test too early or too late, um, the urine may not have enough beta hCG, which is the actual substance that is being tested in your urine pregnancy test. So timing is extremely important. And false, false positives are also very uh, confusing as well as it may strike alarm bells and cause unnecessary worry. So in the testing of clotting disorders, for example, there are certain conditions where the timing is extremely important. And if you test it in the wrong timing, you may actually have false positive results, uh, which then you have to actually repeat in the necessary circumstances. So for example, in protein C and S uh, deficiencies, um, when testing is done very close to the pregnancy loss itself, especially for later pregnancy losses, those levels may actually be low, but it's not actually really low because we know protein C and S are low in pregnancy as a normal uh, response in about to the pregnancy process. So sometimes uh, this can be akin to doing a urine pregnancy test for a male, which, you know, why should we be doing one unless the male wasn't, isn't really a male? Uh, but, you know, sometimes males do get a ur positive urine pregnancy test, but these are due to other reasons. Um, so, you know, the appropriateness and the timing on the test and selecting for the right individual is extremely important. So I think I'll just take the next five minutes to just explain about antiphospholipid syndrome, which is one of the ones that we do test quite a bit for. Uh, and it's one of the more common causes uh, of clotting disorders that result in pregnancy losses. So it is acquired clotting disorder. That means this is not in your genes. And what happens is that um, in our blood vessels, in our blood cells, there's this protein, uh, this thing called phospholipids that have attached proteins on it. And what happens is that the immune system, our immune system sometimes develop antibodies 
against these phospholipid proteins. And this can result in the tendency to clot because this serves something like a sticky tape and it sticks cells against each other. So when you have the presence of antiphospho antibodies, it sticks your cells together and forms a clot. So some people may say, oh, the immune system is the evil guy in this. But you know, the immune system is a good guy overall. Uh, the body immune system is extremely important in producing antibodies to fight infection. So I think you will hear a lot about that in the COVID uh, news where you say, you know, you need to form antibodies to fight COVID. Uh, and some, but sometimes, you know, our immune system does get it a bit wrong and they develop antibodies that attack themselves or ourselves in that sense. And hence, circumstances like this can occur. So in terms of what patients with antiphospholipid syndrome can manifest, they can manifest with blood clots and with pregnancy issues. So just diving a little bit into the pregnancy issue of things. So when you have a pregnancy issue, what do we actually mean by pregnancy issues? So uh, basically we have a miscarriage, and, but we also need to know the timing of the miscarriages. So different miscarriages have uh, different um, gravity to it. So for example, a late miscarriage or miscarriage after the 10 week of pregnancy. So after the first trimester uh, is considered quite significant. Before the uh, first trimester or pregnancy losses that happens during the first trimester, they're actually very common as we have previously seen. So three or more is then considered significant. And if there's a premature death, uh, or if the pregnancy has eclampsia, which is a condition associated with high blood pressure during the later stages of pregnancy. These are all conditions where we raise alarm bells for whether there may be a syndrome of antiphospholipid syndrome. And then what we will do is that we will do the blood test. So why I brought up these time points is really important is because who do we test for? So say, for example, uh, someone who had a miscarriage in the first trimester is the first occurrence. You know, it may not be time to actually do the testing because first trimester miscarriages are extremely common. But for any lady who has a miscarriage after the first trimester, usually we will do testing straight away or say, for example, a premature death. So in terms of the testing, what do we actually test for? The first thing to remember, this is quite specialized testing. There's only a few labs in Singapore that can do the antiphospholipid testing. And we need to actually be quite confirmative of this uh, test. So we actually will try to do it three months apart because sometimes there are certain circumstances that can affect the integrity of the test. As I mentioned, false positive and false negatives. So sometimes things can result in false positive levels. For example, if you have a recent infection, uh, sometimes some non-specific antibodies can turn up that can cause a false positive test. It also can be affected by medications and other medical conditions as well. So say, for example, if you meet the criteria, then you know, what can we do about it? What can we do to try to get a successful pregnancy? Well, we actually uh, use blood thinners. And blood thinners is a very generic term. Uh, there are two different types of blood thinners. One is anticoagulation. Uh, which is blood thinners that uh, basically prevent the clot from actually growing and antiplatelets, which platelets are like a bit like the glue that uh, sticks all the cells together and they usually start off the clotting process. So um, sometimes people will say that anticoagulation is a bit stronger than antiplatelet. Uh, that tends to be true to a certain extent that most of the anticoagulation tend to have a little bit more bleeding risk. But because we can adjust the doses, sometimes that bleeding risk can be equivalent. And the treatment really is based on your history, is based on what the gynecologist as well as us blood doctors assess the situation to be. And most of the time we, we do it in a multidisciplinary means we actually sit down, discuss things, and we come up with a treatment plan according to your circumstances. I often get a lot of patients who say that they really don't like the anticoagulation bit because in pregnancy, for example, unfortunately, um, the only anticoagulation that is demonstrated to be really safe in pregnancy is low molecular weight heparin, which is an injection form of uh, blood thinner. And uh, a lot of my patients initially during the initial discussion really has a, a mind block, mental block towards it because it is injecting yourself every day. Uh, what I can say is that we wish that we had oral options that was considered safe in pregnancy, but unfortunately, none of the oral blood thinners that we have on market has been 
demonstrated to have uh, very good safety data in pregnancy, and hence we are still using uh, injection low molecular heparin. But I think the one thing to say is that it is quite easy to administer. Uh, the needle is not that big, and a lot of my patients, after they get used to it, right, they actually do it quite well. Uh, a lot of other patients also need to inject themselves because of things like diabetes in pregnancy where they also need uh, injection insulin as well. So it's not that uncommon and you, know, you, you, you can do it. <laughs> and with that, um, that is a little bit about clotting in pregnancy. I mean, this is only one of the many things that as a blood doctor, we actually deal in pregnancy. Other blood clots can also happen that not only affect the pregnancy itself in terms of the baby, but also happens in the legs and in the lungs uh, that can also cause quite a bit of issue, which we come on board. We have uh, patients who have family history of blood uh, bleeding disorder, such as hemophilia, as well as low platelet disorder, such as ITP, which also will manage with the gynecologist. Uh, a lot of ladies actually face uh, issues with low blood counts, especially anemia, which sometimes we will get involved as well to help to work up as well as to treat. And we do have patients with pre-existing blood conditions that we do also help the gynecologist along as well. So in SGH, we actually have a combined hematology gynae service where we actually treat our pregnant mummies uh, who have blood disorders or you know, develop some of the conditions that I mentioned and we help the gynecologist uh, and the patient throughout this pregnancy as well as development of a delivery plan so that things are very holistic. And with that, I hope I shed some light on uh, these uh, conditions. I mean, miscarriages are very uh, common and very unfortunate, but I think the important thing to know for you ladies out there is that you're not alone. A lot of us ladies go through this. And the most important thing is to seek help when uh, you need it and to be positive. Okay, I hope um, this gave you a good overview and over to our next speaker. So the next speaker is Dr. Lawrence, he's my dear colleague as well, and he'll be talking a little bit more about lymphoma, so a switch of tone here. Lawrence, over to you. Hi, thank you, Mayan. Um, thanks for the, thanks for organizer to invite me to give the talk today. Uh, let me share the screen. Okay, so uh, my topic is regarding on lymphoma. So the, why is my lymphoma different to others and do I need to do chemotherapy? Okay, uh, so why is lymphoma? Lymphoma is actually a type of blood cancer. It arrives from the lymphocytes and lymphocytes is a type of white blood cells. And it can be found in every part of your body, especially in the lymphatic system. So in the normal circumstance sensors, lymph lymphocytes are immune cell army and function in protecting our body from all the infection, virus, bacterial, fungal. And they can migrate from one place to another place depending on their need. And they could sometimes switch on and off depending on their specific tasks. So when a specific lymphocyte soldier divide in a abnormal way and do not die when there should have been, it become a lymphoma. So those are the examples of lymphoma cells that we look under the microscopes. The top A and B are the purplish one and the bottom C and D are the dark brownish one. It, I mean, the color difference is because of stain different. So what is lymphatic system? Um, to be honest, this is actually a, a all over distributed all over our body and it functions as an immune system as well as a circulatory system. So the common sites for the lymphatic systems are the neck, the armpit, the groin, uh, but, and also involve, uh, but it also involves internal organs like thymus and spleen. So it, it, it can be found every, anywhere in the body, in, uh, in, inside your abdomen, inside your chest, and uh, uh, every part of your organs. So what causes lymphoma? In majority of the cases, uh, the causes are unknown. Uh, and some cases, they're associated with viral infection, example, uh, HIV, EBV, hepatitis C. Uh, in some cases, they're associated with bacterial infection, H. pylori, which is also the, the kind of uh, bacteria causing uh, gastric ulcer. And uh, of course, in some cases, uh, they are associated with solid organ uh, transplant, autoimmune diseases, 
low immunity state due to disease or drug, a majority of the cases are not hereditary. Symptoms of lymphoma, um, it really depends on the site of the disease. It may present, uh, pre present as a lump over your neck, armpit or groin. It can also just swell up inside your body and you could only pick it up on the scan. When it affect the normal function of your specific organ, you will experience related symptoms. Example, um, if your lymphoma compressing on your urinary tube and it can cause kidney failure, it can reduce the urine volume. And if, uh, if the lymphoma occupy the bone marrow, it can cause bone marrow failure. Um, so the some patients uh, presented as constitutional symptoms, and this is what we call uh, like non-specific, well reduced in well-being. Example are like a fatigue, loss of weight, loss of appetite, fever, and night sweats. So this is just a quick diagram to show you uh, what are the common uh, symptoms that the patient can experience when they are having a lymphoma. Um, Okay, uh, now we come to types of lymphoma. There are actually over 60 different types of lymphoma. And the common one is seen in Singapore are over 40 types. They are broadly grouped into Hodgkin and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And under the group of non-Hodgkin, they are further divided into B and T. And under each group, they can have a slow growing, low grade B or T, or a fast growing, which is uh, uh, aggressive high grade T or B. So some cases when the low grade lymphoma turns into a high grade, this is what we call transformation. There are also rare cases when different subtypes of lymphoma happen in a single, single patient. So I, this is just, uh, I pick it up from US, uh, prevalence of subtype of non hodgkin lymphoma. And of course, the Western society is slightly different than the Asian context. Uh, as you can see, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma is the majority, followed by uh, what we call CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, follicular lymph lymphoma, and the rest. So there are many, many types of lymphoma. And of course, they behave differently. So how do we diagnose lymphoma? Um, in the general principle, we need a scan. So it could be a, a CD scan or a PET CD scan. And we need a histology. We need a sample of the cells to look into to confirm the diagnosis. So we need a biopsy. So biopsy of the lymph node or biopsy of the specific uh, or involved organ. And sometimes you also perform bone marrow biopsy. And it, could be, it can be done as part of the diagnostic uh, tool or Part of the staging tool. And now we come to stage, how do we stage a lymphoma? So uh, a lot of times the patients ask me, uh, what is my stage? And um, so the basic principle is the limited stage means stage one and stage two. Uh, example, one patient just have lymph node uh, lymphoma over the neck, then it's actually stage one. But let's say in the neck and also the armpit, then it's stage four, uh, stage two, sorry. And when, when the lymphoma close to the other side of the di diaphragm, uh, then it becomes stage three. And when the lymphoma go beyond the lymph node, involve a solid organ, example, involve your kidney, involve your bone marrow, then it becomes stage four disease. Now we come to uh, talk about uh, low grade lymphoma. Okay, so it could be a T, it could be the B, uh, low-grade lymphoma. Uh, they are generally slow-growing. Uh, some of them might have been in your body for months to years without realizing. Some might stay silent, in a low disease burden, and do not cause you any harm. In those cases, uh, we could actually afford to keep a close eye, continue monitor without the need to treat, weighing on the risk and benefit of the treatment because all treatment comes with toxicity. A small proportion of the cases, we, they release abnormal antibody or protein affecting your body function. In those cases, although they are low grade, we need to treat them. 
High grade lymphoma is, uh, I mean, it's rather straightforward. Grow rapidly and behave aggressively, and they become life threatening if left untreated. Um, some involve crucial sites, it could be uh, in the brain, lymphoma in the brain, in the eye, affecting the spinal cord, affecting the intestine, causing bleeding, internal bleeding. Hence, uh, in those cases, immediate disease control is crucial. So I'd like to introduce a, 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 a simple concept of treatment here. Uh, this is a, a triangle that we have to uh, 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 take, in, in, take into consideration when we're offering a certain treatment for lymphoma. First is the patient uh, fitness. Um, comparing an uh, 80 years old uh, old man with a 30 years old young lady, of course, we, I mean, this, this play an important role in deciding which treatment we're going to offer. The second factor is actually a disease factor or disease tempo. In the low-grade lymphoma, you may be uh, able to afford using a gentle, more gentle treatment regime compared to a high-grade lymphoma, aggressive high-grade lymphoma. You need to hit them hard so that you can control disease rapidly. The third consideration will be the drug efficacy or the toxicity of the treatment. Um, in the ideal world, you want something most efficacious with least toxicity, but we are not living in an ideal world. So a lot of times, high efficacious drug comes with certain toxicity. The first types of treatment for lymphoma is chemotherapy. I'm sure most of you know. Uh, chemotherapy means we giving you some medication and this medication go to your body uh, usually go to your bloodstream and they will circulate to the whole body and kill off the lymphoma cell. But because it's also a chemotherapy, they don't select out which cells they were going to kill. So they will also affect your normal cells. Uh, they can cause hair loss, mouth ulcer, infection, anemia, low platelet. The good side for the chemotherapy is uh, it actually can work rapidly for quick disease control. And most majority of cases is a limited duration. It means that we use the chemotherapy for a limited time frame, example of four months or example of six months duration. And they, are, they have a long track record uh, with non-toxicity profile. So we know how to manage the toxicity uh, if it arises. And at the same time, it is not very costly. So the name of the example uh, chemo chemotherapy regime, uh, example here are CHOP, ICE, DHEP. So you might come across it um, um, uh, when, when any one of you or your family doing the treatment. So we don't use chemotherapy as alone. And usually we combine several chemotherapy drugs to form a regime. So this is a diagram that show you uh, the systemic chemotherapy side effects or toxicity from hair loss, nausea, vomiting, mouth ulcers, weakened immune system, easy bruising, nerve uh, injury, and rash. So the second group of treatment um, that uh, slightly uh, uh, more uh, slightly new and it's actually called immunotherapy. So immunotherapy, we use antibody or we use some medication to activate your own immune system to attack the lymphoma cells. So they, are, they actually carry certain uh, specific um, property to attack majority of lymphoma cells, most, most of the lymphoma cells, and avoid a uh, certain uh, systemic toxicity. So because this uh, antibody or this immune system recognize certain marker on the cells, on the surface of the cells, and they can, uh, hence they can exert the effect on them. At times, it works better when we combine it together with chemotherapy. So it's not exclusively uh, chemo and immunotherapy can be done together. And some of the, some of the cases we need it to be used for a longer duration, 
um, one to two, some of them six months, or some of them one to two years time. And it's slightly more costly. So the drug names are you uh, as shown here, uh, including rituximab, brentuximab, uh, lenalidomide, and pembrolizumab. So this is a simple diagram. So you can, as you can see, on the surface of the cell, there are actually certain marker, and the monoclonal antibody can recognize it. So they can attach on it and signal. Uh, giving out the signal to attract other immune cells to come and kill it. So it's more specific and uh, reduce the systemic side effects. Next one will be uh, targeted therapy. So it's rather new concept here and probably uh, in the market for the last decade. Uh, so it target on the survival pathway of the lymphoma cells and disrupt it and makes the cell die. So it's quite specific and we only feel systemic toxicity and most of, the, most of the drugs are actually oral options. So a lot of patients, when they're on targeted therapy, they just go home, take the tablets and come for a review. It worked better in the, in the current uh, uh, evidence, it worked better in the low-grade lymphoma and especially in the CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. It might be used for long term, means that it just controlled the disease, it couldn't cure the disease. So it's more like treating as a chronic, chronic illness, like example, like, like hypertension, your diabetes. So um, as because the drugs are rather new, so they are a bit more costly. And the name here uh, uh, in the market, um, we have been using ibrutinib, calabrutinib, Idelalysi and Copanlysi. So this is a uh, ibrutinib mechanism of action. So because the cell, especially the B cell, rely on this buton tyrosine kinase pathway to survive. So when the ibrutinib go into the cells and block off the survival pathway, and then the cell couldn't continue to replicate, and then they will die off. So this. Uh, exert effect on the specific cells and avoid uh, systemic side effects. The other treatment uh, that we commonly seen and use in lymphoma is called bone marrow stem cell transplant. So there are two types of bone marrow stem cell trans transplant. The first one is using your own stem cell, we call it autologous. And then the other one is using another person's uh, donor stem cell, we call it allogenic stem cell transplant. So the autologous stem cell transplant is, we have to collect the stem cell first uh, on the patient, and then we follow by giving a high dose chemotherapy, and we infuse the stem cells back to the patient. And allogenic transplant is a different concept. We collect the stem cell from the donor, and then infuse into the patient, and the cell will restore the blood cell system and act as the immune cells against the lymphoma. This bone marrow stem cell transplant has been known, has been used for many, many years. Uh, however, it carry high risk and uh, more systemic toxicity. So there are specific indication where we, we have to use the bone marrow stem cell transplant in the lymphoma treatment, and especially in the relapse setting. So these a quick concept, you collect the stem cell from this patient first, you process it, you store it, so you, you keep it, we keep it cryopreserved uh, in, a, in, a, in a certain minus degree, and followed by giving a chemotherapy, and we infuse back the stem cell to the patient. So this is called autologous bone marrow transplant. In majority of the cases in lymphoma, we do autologous bone marrow stem cell transplant rather than allogenic stem cell transplant. So this is cell therapy. So it's uh, kind of like a, a very uh, new uh, treatment nowadays. Um, we use the existing cells from patients or others. We take it out and extract it from the body. We modify it so it could recognize and kill the lymphoma cells. So one of the examples is this CAR T cell, chimeric antigen receptor T cell. 
And this treatment is very disease and patient specific. So it's indicated in specific disease only. And currently in Singapore, we are doing it for diffuse large B cell lymphoma and B acute lymphoblastic lymphoma or leukemia. Um, this is very individualized. So only these, these cells are only suitable for one patient because it's manufactured for one patient. So it couldn't, cannot be used for other patients. And in US, uh, it was approved in 2017. And in SGA, we started to doing it in 2019, 2020. And we currently, we are the only uh, South Asia site for a uh, commercial CAR T uh, cell product, uh, Kimraya. And Kimraya targets CD19 on the surface of lymphoma. So it, it carries great potential and can be, in the future, it might be used to treat other types of hematological or solid cancer. Um, Unfortunately, its cost is usually uh, an issue. Uh, but bear in mind, this is actually a one-off cost rather than the targeted treatment or uh, immuno treatment that you need to carry it for maybe lifelong or one or two years. So uh, you might come across a few uh, uh, um, uh, recent articles in the, in the, show, in the media and uh, to, uh, on this CAR T cell therapy. So the last I like to introduce, last concept of treatment I'd like to introduce is the clinical trials. So um, they are, I, I think there are many patients has wrong concept about, or, or, or slightly um, um, not aware of clinical trials because there are many new drugs out there under investigation. Some of them at a very early stage of development, but also there are some of them has been around for a while with reasonable, uh, good efficacy and less toxicity. However, they carry short track record. And so in a lot of times, the, clinical, the design of the clinical trial is to monitor the side effects, monitor the efficacy of those drugs in certain lymphoma. It is actually uh, exciting to and sometimes it's potentially beneficial in certain subgroup of patients, especially when the case, the patient has uh, multiply relapsed, uh, refractory to the known drugs that we usually use, the immunotherapy, the, the targeted therapy, and, and, and when the conventional treatment is no longer working, this is actually a, a, a very good way to, to try out. And they are actually being monitored closely for all the toxicity. Um, and they, they, I mean, bound by the ethical uh, uh, law, we actually have to ensure safety in the clinical trials patient. And because the clinical trials is all sponsored, mostly sponsored, and, and a lot of times they are free. So you get free scan, you get free medication. But of course, you need to follow the protocol for the clinical trials. Um, this is era of COVID-19. So I'm, I just want to uh, uh, include these slides here. So a lot, I mean, we are trying to learn the relationship between the COVID-19 and lymphoma. And so far, there's no clear link. However, COVID-19 might affect some patients in terms of their treatment timing and choice. An uh, example, if you have a low-grade lymphoma, uh, your treatment initiation is not imminent, you might want to defer the treatment until you complete the vaccination um, because lymphoma treatment in general suppress or kill your normal lymphocytes. And your normal lymphocyte, as we know, is essential in building your immune system to fight the COVID-19. And this is how the vaccine works in both the mRNA, the vector, or, or in inactivated virus uh, uh, vaccine, vaccination. So uh, we do have some early studies show that the efficacy of COVID-19 vaccine is found to be lower in lymphoma patients, especially those ongoing treatment. So generally, I will, uh, uh, I will suggest my patient go for the third dose booster, especially the ongoing treatment for lymphoma. In the end, vaccination do or not do or do not do, it really depends on the risk and benefit ratio uh, for individual patient. 
So this is just a, a summary for the lymphoma and its journey, treatment journey. It's actually it's not a screen that you cut, for example, your appendicitis. You take out your appendix, you're cured. So in general, the, the lymphoma treatments are, are long. And, and in order to call it cure, we have to maintain in complete remission for at least five years. Sometimes it's not realistic. We, could, we couldn't, we just couldn't achieve cure, but then maybe we can try to live with them peacefully, especially in the lower lymphoma setting. Uh, it's exciting because it's rapid evolving field with a lot of new treatments upcoming. Um, I could emphasize more one size does not fit all patients. And so every patient has to be, uh, uh, has to be undergo personalized treatment care plan. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions later on. So our next speaker for this uh, afternoon's uh, 100 minutes of uh, about blood disorders will be Dr. Uh, no Ida, who is an uh, up-and-coming consultant uh, in the Department of Hematology. She subspecializes in leukemia as well as another condition called uh, myelodysplastic uh, syndrome. So Ida will be the uh, most appropriate person to uh, share with you for the uh, insights uh, into uh, leukemia. And she has entitled her talk is leukemia a death sentence? What's available therapies? What available therapies are there uh, out there? Over to you, uh, Ida. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Ng. And thank you, everybody, to, for making some time this afternoon to join us today. Um, so we're going to talk in the next 20 minutes about leukemia, which is a disease that always sounds very scary uh, because we've always imagined it in the people who have leukemia to be very sick and they can affect anybody from the newborns to the very old. Um, so the word leukemia was first used many years ago, uh, about in around 1845. And this uh, person here is Dr. Rudolf Berkhaus, is a very clever German pathologist. He first coined the word uh, leukemia because as he did a post-mortem in a 50-year-old female who presented with fever and bleeding tendencies, he, he found that a lot of uh, the blood vessels were filled with uh, white blood cells and very few red blood cells. So he then combined the two Greek words of uh, glucose, made white, with alma, called blood. So essentially, leukemia is the cancer of blood and bone marrow. So what happens in leukemia is that you have too many cells in the bone marrow that are most of the time they are cancer cells, um, but very few cells in the blood, or rather the affected cells, are, are, affect, are, are, are low. Uh, to understand more about leukemia, we need to understand what is the bone marrow. Um, and the bone marrow is really is a factory of our blood cells. So when we are young, big human babies, uh, most of the bones um, in our body have red bone marrow. But as we grow older, the space of this red bone marrow are pretty much limited to the flat bones, like the sternum or the breastbone and the hip. So what happens in this limited space is that they produce these baby cells called hematopoietic stem cells. Um, and then after they've been produced, these baby cells start to grow and mature into adult cells. And these adult cells are the ones that we see in the blood, which are the red blood cells, the different types of white blood cells, and the platelets. And they all have varying functions. For example, the red blood cells uh, carry oxygen to your blood, to your body. The various white blood cells help to fight infections and the platelets help to uh, reduce its, uh, incidence of bleeding. What happens in leukemia is that one of these blood cell types can rapidly multiply. Um, and when they multiply, they take up space in this very limited uh, bone marrow and hence the other normal blood cells cannot grow. The leukemia cells, sometimes they are called glass, they are normal, so they're very uh, large and aggressive, but really they serve no purpose in your body at all. So if you do a blood smear, so a blood smear is when a doctor takes a sample of your blood test and look under the microscope. 
what you see in a normal person would be this very happy population of different types of cells. You can see the background, uh, the red blood cells. Uh, you can see these four cells, which are the white blood cells that help to fight infection. Uh, they are called neutrophils. And if you could see in the back, in the, the small cells at the background, the tiny dots, they are called platelets. But what happens in leukemia is that there's only one cell that predominates. And you can see they are large, aggressive, ugly looking. These are blast. And because there are so many of them, the normal cells, which are the red blood cells, and the platelets are very much reduced. Can, can you tell? So how can someone tell if they have leukemia? And unfortunately, a lot of times the symptoms are very subtle. In fact, I do have many patients who only know that they have leukemia because of incidental finding during a pre employment check. Because when they did the blood counts, doctors noted that they had very, very high white blood cell and hence was referred to a blood specialist. Um, in many times, the symptoms are subtle and they are usually due to low normal blood cells. Like I mentioned, the red blood cells are, uh, are there to carry oxygen to the, blood, to the body. So if you have less of them, there are less oxygen to the rest of the body. There are symptoms like tiredness and breathlessness when you do just a little bit of work. If you have little platelets, there's that cells that help to control the bleed or help to pluck out the bleeding sites in the body. Then you can present with easy, easy bruising and frequent minor bleeds. Um, and if you have white, low white blood cell counts, you have frequent infections um, and that most of the time manifests as fever. Just bear in mind that a lot of these symptoms are very vague, they are very, very common, and the majority of patients who present to the doctors with these symptoms, they do not have the chemo. So how do doctors affect that they have the chemo? The symptoms are very vague. So they do need to proceed with physical examination and some other tests uh, on examination. Certain things that could point out to more uh, malignant cause of uh, the, the symptoms are things like swollen lymph nodes, and large spleen, which is the organ on the left side of the tummy, if the patient looks very pale, or they have multiple bruises or petechiae. So petechiae has a small red dots, um, especially in the lower legs. The doctors, if, if need to, they may proceed with doing a blood count, a full blood count, which is a blood test. And usually this is when the abnormality will be detected and referred to us. So number one, if you see a lot of these cancer cells called blast in, in the blood count, Number two, if the water count is very, very high, especially if there's no sign of infection, they have no fever as such, or if the blood counts are very, very low, with no um, obvious cause. But of course, the majority of time to confirm that you have leukemia, it, it's not just with the blood test, you need to proceed to do a bone marrow biopsy, which is a special test that is done in, uh, in a specialized center. But the doctors will need to take a little bit of the bone marrow, which is in the, like I mentioned, it's usually in the flat bones. So the most common site to the bone marrow biopsy is in the cheek bone. Um, it's a it's a big site, a very simple procedure to be done. And what the doctors will send for a test to look for presence of blast, and sometimes certain mutations that may help to guide what treatment to give. I think there's a question in the chat, like how do we proceed to confirm that the someone has a CML? So that can also be done by a bone marrow biopsy, or usually the first test is by doing a blood test to check for a certain mutation called BCL A1. Um, there are many, many types of leukemia, just like Dr. Lawrence explained, and many types of lymphoma. But just to simplify things, we, we mentioned, I mentioned here four types of leukemia that we've commonly heard about. Um, they are divided into the myeloid, which is the type of white cells that are affected, and the lymphoid. So myeloid, is, myeloid and lymphoid are both different types of white blood cells. And then we, we categorize them by how fast the onset of the symptoms are. So in acute, the disease progresses very quickly in matters of weeks. Uh, compared to chronic, where it progresses very slowly, sometimes over years. So you have the acute myeloid leukemia and the um, you have chronic myeloid leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, how do people get leukemia? A lot of times when people measure leukemia, what, at least what I imagine it to be, as I associate it with the atomic bomb, it is not long after Hiroshima bombing. Um, Japanese doctors noticed that there was an increase in leukemia cases, even in young, in young children. 
Uh, but of course, this is not a very common cause of it. It's, it's not having any atomic bombs nowadays. Uh, but other things are more common, things like exposure to chemotherapy for other cancers like breast cancer, colon cancer, or radiotherapy. If they have previous known blood disorder like myelodysplastic syndrome or one of the myeloproliferative disease that Dr. Davis will be talking about later on, uh, they can progress to acute leukemia um, after a few years. Or certain occupational exposure like benzene, which can be found in certain types of paint and from the height. Um, inherited types of leukemia are not very common, but we are increasingly acknowledging more and more types of mutation um, that can lead to this inherited uh, disease. So it may not be so common now, but we may identify more, and hence it may be more common in the future. But bear in mind that for the majority of patients, the cause remain unknown. It's not due to the lifestyle, it's not because of what you do, what you haven't done enough. Um, a lot of times it's just, just luck. Another question that we often get is, can leukemia be staged? Is it stage one or stage four? Uh, unfortunately, we don't stage leukemia as such, uh, not like you know, breast cancer or colon cancer. And the reason being is that blood in itself is circulates everywhere in the body. So by definition, it's stage four for every leukemia. Um, rather, instead of using staging, we use prognostic scores. Um, different leukemias have their own uh, set of different scoring. And they tell us whether the patient is a good risk or a bad risk. And what that means is that it tells the patient or the doctors whether this patient has a high likelihood to survive the cancer, what's the chance of responding to a particular treatment, and what's the chance of progression to acute leukemia. Um, the treatment for leukemia, unfortunately, is not simple. Um, it can take months to many years. And sometimes it involves a combination of therapy with prolonged hospital stays. And of course, the treatment is complicated. Is, uh, it can be associated with many, many complications. And you're not like simple Panadol, where you take a simple tablet, the onset can be very quick, and the complications can be pretty mild or, 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 or transient. Um, and hence, when doctors want to decide what treatment to give, they have to balance out between what's the chance of the treatment uh, providing response to the patients, as well as what are the complications that can occur uh, from these therapies. Because there are many factors involved in this, and they don't just take into consideration the disease factors by the prognostic score that I mentioned previously, but also the patient factors like how fit are they, what other problems do they have, what other medications the patients are on. Um, the one similar condition in two different patients may be treated very, very differently. So in the past, when people say leukemia treatment, chemotherapy, and that is what people imagine the most, uh, patients with loss of alopecia or, or baldness, they lose hair, they can't eat, so they get very thin, they see the ribs is very poor boy, and it's very bad, uh, nausea and vomiting. And all the time after chemotherapy, they're sitting there in front of a toilet bowl vomiting. So it's a very a, a, a pitiful sight uh, to see. But rest assured that now doctors are trying to improve the therapy of, of cancer leukemia. And more and more, we see these kind of patients, very old patients who have been diagnosed with leukemia, given therapy that allowed them to stay out of hospital with very, very few side effects. And look, the hair is still pretty much intact. So there are many types of leukemia, just like uh, leukemia therapies, just like lymphoma therapies. And these are the main types of therapies that in, classic, in broad classifications. They are the chemotherapy, uh, targeted therapy, immunotherapy, radiation, and stem cell transplant. So with chemo, just like Dr. Lawrence mentioned, it can be given either by injection into the blood, injection under the skin, or even just simple tablets. Many times, the, the, the treatment will be combining uh, one or more of the chemotherapy drugs. And the consist of cycles, like how, how many days per treatment followed by days of rest. And the number of cycles can either be finite or indefinite. Uh, more and more nowadays, as we will see later, there are targeted therapy that only focus on specific features of leukemia cells. Uh, and I will also explain later about immunotherapy. In many patients, uh, they may receive one or more combination of the treatment above, either simultaneously or sequentially. 
So next, we will look through the various treatments and achievements that we have made in the treatment of leukemia. Um, one of the uh, groundbreaking uh, treatment in leukemia, so not just leukemia, but also uh, various cancer, is the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. In order to change is that it changes our mindset of how we approach cancers. That, that is a possibility that we can give treatment that only targets some specific uh, features on the cancer cells. And uh, it's amazing that the treatment is just an oral therapy. It's very much well tolerated. People can take it outpatient and still continue to work you know, and, and earn income for the family. Um, in the past, CML is invariably uh, eventually a deadly disease. And the only way to cure them is to undergo transplant, which is not a simple procedure. And now this, if you look at this graph, just to show you how groundbreaking this therapy is. Um, so this is a survival graph. And on the, um, the horizontal axis is the follow up the time in months that we doctors see patients. And on the vertical axis, is what's the probability of them to survive? Uh, so if you look at the control, which is the dots, uh, these are patients or rather healthy controls with no disease. Um, and the, the solid line are those diagnosed with CML, but before the era of uh, TKI. Um, before TKI, doctors used to treat CML with other types of chemotherapy. But you can see that at that time, even with those therapies, the survival is not much different from CML without any therapy. But you can see here that if they start the of TKI and if they respond, the survival curve is very much similar to a patient with no cancer. So that's just how groundbreaking this TKI is. Another amazing thing that we've achieved in the past uh, 30 years or so is there's a one type of leukemia that we can now potentially cure without chemotherapy. So there's one uh, type of acute malignant leukemia called acute pro-malignant leukemia. So just just over 30 years ago, it's a disease that is very feared by doctors because patients are coming very sick and they can die very, very quickly. But nowadays, the cure rate is approaching 80%. And that's all thanks to uh, a doctor in China called Dr. Uh, Wang Zhen Yi. And it's a very interesting approach that he took out of the need for economic uh, uh, purpose because the drugs at, at that time to take APML was very expensive in China was not a very rich country at that time. And he combined it with the Confucius philosophy that you know, criminals can actually be rehabilitated instead of killed. Then he used the, this, these two combinations of philosophy and economic needs to introduce ATRA, uh, which is a type of high-dose vitamin A, to, to cause the cancer cells to change into normal cells. And he used it in 24 patients with APNL, and of that 24, 23 were found to be cured. So that's, that's how impressive it was. But it took time for that approach to gain traction in the West, because even as now, there's always some suspicion whatever comes from China, whether it's real or not, that eventually it's now widely embraced and is routinely part of our treatment for APML. Another achievement that we made is in the therapy of the ALL in children. In just a period of 50 years, you can see that the lower graph there, the pink graph, is like in 1970, 1960s. The survival rate is very, very low. And like the cure for that is only about 10%. But nowadays, uh, in 2020, the, the cure rate is in the excess of 90%. Um, and there's a combination of hard work from our pediatricians to combine multiple combinations of chemotherapy, as well as now with a greater understanding of the disease, trying to incorporate targeted therapies into the um, treatment repertoire. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people are aware of this uh, very cute boy from, from England that was diagnosed with ALL and he relaxed a few times. And then he came here to MH to receive uh, a core T cell therapy, and now he's still well in the life. So that's a, a, an up and coming uh, therapy uh, for leukemia. It's not, uh, in fact, SGH is one of the centers that have, we have been using CAR T cells for many of the patients as well. Um, it's not uh, uh, 
as easy as it sounds because there are many, many processes to get it uh, along the way, but we are improving our, uh, our protocols so that you know, it will be more attainable to many other patients. Um, this is just to show that in the past five years or so, uh, AML, which is a cancer that is very difficult to treat, and you can see about 20 years or more, there are no new therapies at all for AML. But in just, just the past five years, we have seen like approvals of nine new drugs by FDA um, alone, and more and more are coming in the next few years. But of course, challenges remain. Um, so for patients like the elderly with many, many uh, comorbids or many other disease, uh, with poor functional status, it is still difficult to treat them uh, while you know, trying to balance out the complications from the treatment. Uh, for patients who relapses after initial therapy or they don't respond at all to initial therapy, it, it also remains difficult uh, to treat. Um, and of course, the cost of cancer care nowadays, not just in Singapore, but worldwide, is really uh, getting very much unaffordable. And that's all I have today. Uh, nothing that I mentioned here can't be found in other websites. Uh, but if you are like me, who prefers books to websites, there's this one book that's specifically published, um, and this very uh, clever doctor from Cleveland, Mikhail Sikaris, published this book, and he wrote about three leukemia patients. It's wonderfully written um, and told and shared about what are the different therapies and what are the difficulties that he and the patients went through. Um, so it, it makes a good bedtime story, I think. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah, so, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ida, for that very enlightening uh, talk, which I'm sure the, would have provided the audience with uh, uh, many answers to some of the questions that they uh, have. I think one of the beauties of uh, pandemic slash endemic times is now the ability to hold public forums uh, from the comforts of our homes. Uh, and with that, of course, besides the uh, speaker, you do get a support, supporting cast uh, sometimes uh, of, um, of um, other people uh, in the home environment. So I think with that, I'd like just to thank the audience very much for the understanding, uh, the suggestions that they have, and most importantly, the support that they uh, have uh, for us operating in such an environment uh, as we do now. Right? Uh, let's move on to our next uh, topic for this uh, afternoon. The last topic, and this will be delivered by Dr. Denise Tan, who is a consultant a hematologist. Denise practices uh, in Sengkang General Hospital as well as in Singapore uh, General Hospital. And she has a special interest in a group of disorders called the myeloproliferative uh, neoplasms uh, long-term, which she will explain to you a bit more as part of her talk. So her talk this afternoon will be entitled, Why Are My Blood Counts High? An Overview of Myeloproliferative Neoplasms, Diagnosis, Symptoms, and Treatment. Denise, please. Thank you, Dr. Ng. And uh, thank you to all our attendees for staying until the end. Um, okay, so um, basically today I'm going to talk about myeloproliferative neoplasms um, or NPNs. Um, they are a type of bone marrow or blood tumor which are most often, okay, but not always associated with high blood counts. All right, so... Um, I'll cover two topics today. Um, so before we go into MPNs, I would first like to talk about some reasons why blood cells can be raised. Um, this is because many of the referrals we receive are for further evaluation of uh, incidental finding of raised blood counts. And patients all often come to see us for the first time very worried about their condition and wondering if they have a blood cancer. Um, after that, then we can go on to talk about a brief overview into myeloproliferative neoplasms. So first, what causes blood counts to be raised? Uh, there are three main types of blood counts, um, our blood cells actually in our uh, blood. I think most of you might already know there are red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So we'll talk a bit about each of them. Okay, so red blood cells, um, they carry oxygen um, and also carbon dioxide throughout our body. Okay, um, now if red blood cell counts are high, uh, this may actually just be your body's natural adaptation to low oxygen levels in the body. Sometimes the cause is very obvious, for example, smoking or severe heart and lung disease. Uh, but sometimes the cause can also be um, 
uh, not so obvious, um, as in the case of obstructive sleep apnea. Um, this is a condition that is often underdiagnosed. Um, and what happens is uh, people or a person may actually have loud snoring, actually stop breathing uh, when they're sleeping at night, but not realize it, uh, resulting in low oxygen levels. Um, erythropoietin is also the hormone that um, causes our bone marrow to produce red blood cells. Sometimes there's an abnormal uh, excess of erythropoietin in our body. Uh, this might be produced by uh, tumors, so non-blood tumors, for example, liver, kidney tumors, or uh, renal cysts even. Okay. Um, and also some drugs may uh, mimic the effect of erythropoietin. Um, once we root these out, then we have to think about uh, whether our bone marrow is just abnormally overproducing red blood cells, in which case this is a type of uh, myeloproliferative neoplasm called polycythemia vera. Um, now we go on to white blood cell count. So um, as we've uh, kind of talked about in the Q&A earlier on, there are actually many types of um, white blood cells. Okay, um, each type has its own specific role in protecting the body and mainly um, it protects us from germs. Okay, so if we think about that, the, the by and far the most common cause of elevated white blood cell counts is really um, infections, which can be vi viral, bacterial, or any form of inflammation in the body that um, triggers our immune system. Okay, however, we also do look at which type of white blood cell is raised, and that can give us more information and sometimes points to certain diagnoses, for example, uh, if the lymphocytes are high, Dr. Lawrence uh, previously talked about lymphomas. Uh, if a type of white blood cell called eosinophils are high, we usually make sure that the patient does not have any allergies, parasitic infections, um, no new drugs causing some reactions or immune conditions. And again, um, one of the other causes, again, is um, overproduction by the bone marrow in the case of myeloproliferative neoplasms. Um, now we go on to the last main blood cell called the platelets. Okay, now platelets uh, mentioned by, I think, uh, Dr. May N, uh, actually cells that help us to control bleeding. Okay, uh, when we cut ourselves, the platelets actually collect at the site of the injury and they form a plug to help us stop bleeding, right? Um, now the most common cause of high platelets are really what we call reactive states where the platelet increases in reaction to something else happening in the body. Uh, it can be infection, it can be inflammation, or even low iron levels can cause the platelet count to be high. Right? Um, now, these are by far more common, but again, uh, we do have to think um, whether it is due to a myeloproliferative neoplasm. Okay, so now that we know um, what the main types of blood cells are, what they do, and what might cause them to be raised, uh, we can go on to talk about um, myeloproliferative neoplasms, also called MPNs. Um, myeloproliferative neoplasms are blood tumors where there is overproduction of one or a few blood cell lineages. Milo just means marrow, so bone marrow, and proliferative means that there's a lot of um, growth of the cells in the bone marrow. So the question arises as to how does a stem cell, a normal stem cell, evolve into a MPN? Okay, so if you just look at um, what's in the red box, okay, um, I start off with a normal stem cell, okay, that acquires what we call driver mutations. Okay, now driver mutations are mutations that confer a growth advantage to the cells with the mutation. Okay, um, these mutations are not uh, usually inherited uh, in this case, um, but they are acquired by a person uh, over time as we age. Okay, this clone of cells then further grows and differentiates into mature blood cells, in this case, the white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets, resulting in a myeloproliferative neoplasm. Um, now, you can see that a, a stem cell can differentiate into many types of blood cells. Okay? Um, and uh, there are many types of myeloproliferative neoplasms, okay? uh, but generally, they are classified by the main type of the blood cell that is involved. Um, and of all these types, um, these three are the, what we call the classical MPNs, uh, which form the, which are really the three most common types. Um, and we will just focus on these three in our discussions. So to just tell you a little bit more about the three types of classical MPNs, uh, firstly, we've got uh, primary myelofibrosis. Um, 
Myeloid fibrosis occurs when there is thickening or scarring of the fibers inside the bone marrow. Um, and this can cause a uh, lowered production of blood cells, in particular, the red blood cells. Okay, so if you look at this illustration, um, the picture on the left here shows a normal um, bone marrow. Okay, but the picture on the right shows a patient who has myelofibrosis. You can see that these cells called fibroblasts that produce fibrous tissue in the bone marrow have increased and proliferated. Okay, um, and resulting in uh, what we call very colloquially like a scarring, increased scarring and, and hardening of the bone marrow. Um, this is what um, we might see on the bone marrow biopsy of a patient. Um, it might be a bit small, but you can see that there are these fine lines um, that are stained a uh, darker color, and these are actually the um, fibrous tissue. Polycythemia vera is caused by um, overproduction of the red blood cells in the bone marrow. So again, if we look at this illustration, uh, this on the left is a normal blood picture, but you can see that in polycythemia vera, the red blood cells are um, increased and are very um, compacted together. If we take um, a sample of the patient's blood uh, and compare it to a normal sample, um, what happens over time is that the red blood cells uh, will settle to the bottom. And you can see that for the same volume of blood, okay, a polycythemia vera patient actually has a larger percentage of red blood cells, okay, which makes the blood um, thicker in a sense. Um, essential thrombocytosis um, is when the number of platelets in the blood is higher than normal. And again, in the picture on the right, you can see that the platelets have also increased. Uh, now, we mentioned before that driver mutations are the main mutations that drive the myeloproliferative disease. Uh, there are three main driver mutations. Um, firstly, there is uh, JAK2 that was discovered in 2005. MPL um, discovered in 2006, and Cal Reticulin, or Cal R, uh, discovered in uh, 2013 more recently. Um, the different types of uh, MPNs do have a different distribution of the mutations. Um, polycythemia vera patients are, are mainly driven by a JAK2 mutation, whereas for essential thrombocytemia and uh, myelofibrosis, about 50 to 60% of patients will have a JAK2 mutation. 30 to 20 percent uh, will have a Cal reticulin mutation and 5 to 10 percent will have an MPL mutation. Um, however, there are um, a substantial portion of patients, uh, about 10 to 15 percent, that we say triple, we call them like triple negative, which means that we don't find any of these three um, driver mutations, but often they have other mutations um, that are driving the condition. Uh, now, um, then that that leads to the next question as to how these mutations can cause increased uh, blood cell production. Um, now, what happens in normal regulation of blood cell production um, is shown here in the first diagram on the left. So um, a growth factor, in this case erythropoietin, okay, will bind to the surface of the cell. Okay, it causes um, and binds to a receptor. It causes two receptors to come together and activate um, a signaling pathway involving a JAK2 molecule that then um, results in activation of genes that are um, needed for growth and proliferation of the cell. Um, now, what happens if there's a JAK2 mutation is shown in the second picture. So um, in the absence of a growth factor binding, uh, what happens is the mutated JAK2 um, still can activate the receptor and result in the signaling pathway, uh, causing inappropriate ac activation of the same genes. Um, the Cal reticulin and the MPL mutations work in a similar way. Um, they also can, um, in different ways, bring the receptors together in the absence of any growth factor and then result in um, activation of, uh, of the same genes. Okay, so um, we'll just go on and talk briefly about how a myeloproliferative neoplasm is diagnosed. Um, now, when we evaluate a patient with high blood counts, we often start with simple blood tests first. Okay? Um, earlier in the talk, we mentioned that um, there are other causes of raised blood counts. It's not always due to an MPN. Um, and um, often the blood tests we do are to evaluate for these other causes 
before we move on to more specialized, um, more expensive or invasive tests. Um, genetic tests are um, crucial in the diagnosis of MPNs. Uh, most often they are taken from the blood, but they can also be taken from a bone marrow sample. Um, these are to look um, for the driver mutations that we talked about. Uh, the majority, if not, um, but not all um, MPNs uh, will have a driver mutation. Now, in some patients, but not all, okay, uh, we may need to proceed to um, a bone marrow test. Okay, now, the bone marrow is where the blood cells are produced. And um, sometimes in order to confirm the diagnosis, we need to look specifically at the cells within the bone marrow and the architecture of the bone marrow under the microscope. Um, the bone marrow may also give us additional genetic information uh, that the blood cannot. So um, this is how the bone marrow test is. We will insert a needle into the, um, the hip bone. Um, uh, so not actually the spine, but at the side uh, with a patient lying on, on his or her side. So it's quite a straightforward procedure for hematologists and usually takes only um, 30 minutes to half in, uh, 30 minutes to 40, 45 minutes. Okay, so we will move on to um, uh, two main complications of myeloproliferative neoplasms that I wanted to talk about. Um, now, the main complication in most MPNs is a predisposition to thrombosis or uh, blood clot formation. Um, this can happen in both the arteries um, and the veins of the body. Um, if it happens in the arteries, one of the major organs um, can, it can happen in is the brain and where it results in a stroke or in the heart, uh, resulting in a heart attack. Um, and in the veins, um, if it happens in the lungs, it can be life-threatening and we call it a pulmonary embolism. It happens in the legs, the veins of the legs. And in particular, um, for myeloproliferative neoplasms, it may even happen in uh, the abdominal veins. Um, in the past, uh, many MPN patients uh, would, uh, would pass away from lethal blood clots. But now we know that there are various ways we can minimize the patient's risk of blood clots and, um, and often help them to live a, um, a, just a normal duration of life. Okay, so uh, we'll talk about that a bit later in the treatment section. Okay, um, the next complication is that of disease progression. Um, unfortunately, disease progression is a complication that we cannot prevent, although we can monitor closely for it and try to intervene earlier. Um, the diagram here uh, shows how an MPN patient's disease may evolve over time. So as mentioned before, first we start off with um, uh, a stem cell and um, dr acquired driver mutations. Um, now um, that then results in um, selection and growth of a particular clone of cells. And as more mutations develop over time, um, a patient may eventually develop a myeloproliferative neoplasm. Um, this uh, may be essential thrombocytosis, polycythemia vera, or myelofibrosis upfront. Um, and often, in, especially in the case of uh, essential thrombocytosis and polycythemia vera, um, patients may actually stay in this stage for a very long time, um, for years, if not could just always remain at this stage. Um, this is the stage where um, vascular events like thrombosis uh, uh, are, um, are common and we need to try and prevent that. Okay. Um, now, as more mutations develop, um, the patients may, um, the, the condition may actually evolve, evolve over time into a myelofibrosis or acute leukemia. Um, now, the myelofibrosis stage is uh, characterized by um, increased fibrosis in the marrow, resulting in lower blood counts, especially anemia, um, the patient's spleen might actually start growing in size, and also it can be associated with um, symptoms such as lethargy, um, uh, tiredness, weight loss, abdominal discomfort. Um, and um, the duration of time that patients stay in this stage is variable, uh, ranging from a short while to many years, depending on the mutations that the patient has at that point of time. Um, now, if acute leukemia develops, um, from the myeloproliferative neoplasm, as mentioned by Dr. Ida. Unfortunately, this sort of leukemia is, um, at this point of time, very difficult to treat. 
And because of the numerous mutations that have been acquired over time, it can be very resistant to standard types of chemotherapy. So um, I'll just talk a little bit about the common symptoms that an MPN patient may have. Um, there are symptoms that are due directly to the high and low blood count. So um, high in uh, patients with high blood counts, okay, um, they, may, they may get gout. Now gout is when certain joints get very red, hot and inflamed and painful. Um, this occurs because of the increased uric acid from the increased um, number of cells. Um, and also, paradoxically, um, if the platelet counts are too high, although we say that um, high platelet counts are associated with blood clot formation, paradoxically, patients may also find that they bleed more easily. Um, low blood counts may occur in patients with myelofibrosis or may also be a result of treatment. Um, and I think Dr. Ida has mentioned that anemia can result in lethargy, low, blood, low white blood cell counts can result in infections, and again, low platelet counts can result in bleeding. Microvascular symptoms um, are caused by um, tiny micro blood clots in the small blood vessels and also the high blood counts. Um, it can result in neurological symptoms like headache, dizziness, memory changes. Uh, erythromalacia is a phenomenon where the hands and the fingers can turn red and painful suddenly without a trigger. And lastly, itching, um, especially um, in polycythemia vera patients after a shower or bath, can be due to these uh, microvascular um, uh, blood clots and also activation of immune cells in the skin. Um, patients may also have what we call uh, constitutional symptoms. These are a result of the ongoing inflammation throughout the body. It may result in fever, uh, profuse sweating, especially at night. Um, so not just normal sweating, but sweating where um, you might wake up and the entire bed is uh, drenched with sweat, even if it's the weather has not been very hot. Okay, um, now, weight loss has many possible causes. Okay, um, and maybe due to a systemic inflammation, increased consumption of energy by the body, and also um, enlarged, an enlarged spleen that we'll talk about later on may cause um, a patient to have poor appetite. Um, patients may also have abdominal symptoms such as abdominal discomfort. Um, and uh, sometimes if the spleen is enlarged, uh, patients may also have um, the sensation of feeling very full very quickly when they are eating. You can see here, um, this is where our spleen is, and usually it's hidden behind the rib cage. We can't feel it. Uh, but if the spleen becomes enlarged, then it, it, uh, you can see that a doctor can actually feel the spleen uh, because it sticks out below the, the uh, margin of the rib cage. Um, and what happens is the stomach sits here. So when the spleen is enlarged, it can actually compress on the stomach and prevent it from expanding fully during a meal. Sometimes the abdominal discomfort a, um, a patient may have is also due to blood clot formation um, in the abdominal veins, as we mentioned before. Okay, so this is my last slide um, about treatment options in brief. Um, uh, I won't go into the details because uh, it may make, not make any sense to you unless you um, are being treated for MPN, uh, but really just more about the treatment goals. Um, one of the main goals of treatment uh, in an MPN patient uh, is to prevent blood clots like we talked about before, especially in uh, essential thrombocytosis and polycythemia vera patients. Uh, one of the ways to do this is to give blood thinners, uh, but also we cannot forget that we need to control other risk factors for heart disease and stroke, um, such as diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, and smoking. Um, often, uh, our patients are very fixated on the fact that they have uh, um, on the blood count and they forget that um, these other conditions are very important as well. Um, and bringing down... Uh, um, blood counts uh, can also help to prevent blood clots. Um, so we do have, if the blood counts are high, uh, we do have oral medications for this, um, injection medications, and in the case of polycythemia vera, uh, we can also uh, do venesection, which is um, uh, taking out blood from a patient, very much like a blood donation, just that we don't donate the blood, but instead we uh, discard it because the blood is um, considered a uh, uh, to have abnormal cells. Um, in a 
in myelofibrosis patients, we mentioned that they can have anemia and we also have medications for this. Um, and um, sometimes um, if the medications do not work or patients cannot have them for some reasons, we can give uh, blood transfusions on a regular basis. Uh, now, um, we mentioned before that in uh, myelofibrosis patients and in a small percentage of polycythemia vera patients, um, the spleen size can um, be quite large um, and can cause symptoms. So in this case, we have some oral medicines, a JAK inhibitor called raxolitinib. Um, a second choice would be radiotherapy to the spleen and now very rarely uh, do we do surgery to completely remove the spleen. Um, lastly, uh, our MPN patients can actually have quite a bit of symptoms like we talked about before. Um, and um, some of these symptoms, especially if they are due to um, generalized systemic inflammation in the body, uh, we can use um, the drug ruxolitinib to help to improve their symptoms. And last but not least, um, just a note here is that while all these previous mentioned treatments help to control the disease and prevent blood clots, they are not curative. Um, the only cure for higher risk myelofibrosis specifically is really um, an allogeneic bone marrow transplant. Uh, Dr. Lawrence has mentioned bone marrow transplant um, in his talk. Um, and it's not a simple procedure. It does have a lot of um, risks. So it's only really indicated uh, when the disease itself is severe and enough uh, to justify the risk of a transplant. So in summary, um, myeloproliferative neoplasms are really not the only cause of raised blood counts. Um, there are a lot more other causes that are much more common. Um, and uh, we need to rule those causes out first. Um, myeloproliferative neoplasms are due to acquired mutations in the stem cells of the bone marrow that then result in overproduction of mature blood cells. They can progress to more aggressive conditions if more mutations develop over time. And the goals of treatment in, does include prevention of blood clots, improvement in blood counts, reduction of symptoms, and improvement in the spleen size if it's enlarged. So that's it for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Denise, for that very comprehensive uh, outline uh, in as simple terms as possible uh, about uh, the group of condition called um, myeloproliferative uh, disorders. Uh, a big word of thank you to the audience for being very participative in this afternoon's uh, public forum. I think we now have more than uh, 70 questions uh, that you have posed. I think our team of uh, of doctors, uh, which uh, includes um, MAN, Ida, uh, Denise Lawrence, and also Dr. Dave Riemann, who is in the background, uh, has been actively answering uh, most of your questions uh, in order that uh, you have the benefit of uh, being able to uh, see the answers before the uh, end of this forum. But we have chosen a few uh, um, of your questions that uh, probably um, can be answered online for the benefit of the uh, audience uh, at large. So I think the first questions that we have, uh, the first set of questions that we have pertains to the uh, topic that Dr. Uh, Mayen has uh, presented uh, earlier on, uh, and that's in regards to antiphospholipid syndrome, a condition that she has uh, mentioned. And one of the first questions that was asked was, uh, what causes uh, people to get antiphospholipid syndrome? Can it heal? Uh, and is there a possible possibility that there is no need uh, for blood thinning medication for the rest of their lives. Uh, right. Mayan, would you like to answer that? Yeah, yeah sure, no problem. So I think uh, for the first part of the question, what causes uh, antiphospholipid syndrome? Um, as I explained a little bit in my talk, it's really a, a, a condition of an autoimmune disorder. And what autoimmunity means is that your body is producing uh, this protein is called antibodies and it's attacking the phospholipid uh, components of your blood cells and your blood lining, uh, blood vessel lining. So um, it's not something that is caused by lifestyle or caused by genetics. It's something that just happens spontaneously because the immune system decided to attack itself. 
uh, we don't really know the exact cause of this autoimmunity and there are also a whole host of other conditions, not only antiphospholipid syndrome that has a similar uh, disease run. So can it be healed? Uh, I think if you are considering healing means that means the condition goes away. Uh, I guess in this current setting, we don't have a treatment that can cause the condition or the syndrome to go away completely, but we do have effective treatment to prevent the complications of APS, uh, such as blood thinners. So in terms of uh, do you need to consume blood thinners for life? Um, usually when I talk to my patient about the whole topic of blood thinners, I always say it's a risk versus benefit, a bit like the balancing act that I showed in my slides earlier. And there, there will be situations where some patients, although they have antiphospholipid syndrome, may also have conditions where they may have some tendency to bleed. And you know, in those periods, maybe perhaps the blood thinners may have to be stopped. But as a general uh, discussion, usually we will recommend blood thinners for patients for a standard period of time, but it's always a constant discussion and review of the patient situation in terms of whether the blood thinners should be continued. Thank you, Amen, for uh, that uh, question. And dovetailing into uh, this is the another question that was asked, and uh, that's relationship to anticoagulants uh, and antiphospholipid syndrome as well. So, can anticoagulants affect the fetus, uh, and can the antiphospholipid uh, antibody be removed instead of using anticoagulants? Very logical questions, I mean, What's your take on that? So, I think in terms of anticoagulation affecting the fetus. Uh, yes, certain anticoagulants can affect the fetus and hence that's why certain anticoagulants uh, we don't usually recommend in the use uh, in a pregnancy uh, indication. So perhaps the uh, older anticoagulant, which is warfarin, uh, does have uh, effects on the fetus in terms of fetal development. Uh, so um, in most circumstances, usually warfarin is not usually used. Um, and then, for example, in terms of uh, the new, newer anticoagulants called the direct oral anticoagulant or DOEX for short, um, it doesn't have a, a lot of safety data in uh, pregnancy and hence it's also not used. Um, in terms of the whole idea of blood thinners affecting the fetus, and I guess uh, there are some consideration about bleeding tendencies, uh, because the low molecular weight heparins tend not to cross the uh, placenta barrier to the fetus, they tend not to have direct um, consequences due to the, the effect because it doesn't go to the fetus. Uh, but if anything that affects mommy can affect baby. La. So for example, because when you're on blood thinner, sometimes you have increased bleeding risk, the bleeding that can happen within mommy can affect baby at some time. So for example, uh, when if you have a, any condition that leads to bleeding within pregnancy, for example, low-lying placenta and all that, this can sort of complicate the situation. In terms of antiphospholipid antibodies being removed, I think that's actually a very excellent uh, frame of thought. Um, unfortunately, at this point of time, we don't really have very effective medication to remove, per se, the antiphospholipid antibodies. There are certain situations uh, where antiphospholipid syndrome overlap with other autoimmune conditions, and we use uh, medications called uh, immunosuppressive therapy to actually get the body to decrease the production of these antibodies. But in the setting of just pure antiphospholipid syndrome alone, um, usually it's still blood thinners as the main uh, treatment arm. Thank you very much, Ani. I'd like to move on uh, to another, uh, the next question. Uh, and this will be a question for uh, Lawrence uh, that was asked uh, very briefly uh, um, about what are the risk factors uh, for um, developing lymphomas uh, or what are the risk factors associated with lymphoma development uh, in patients? Lawrence. Uh, yeah, I mentioned in my slides, uh, uh, there are some risk factors uh, we know that can trigger or lead to a lymphoma. Uh, sometimes uh, some HIV virus, EBV virus, uh, hepatitis C virus. And of course, at the same, same some, some, some scenario, the patient's underlying uh, disease, or disease or illness can be part of the risk factor causing uh, lymphoma. But I must admit, in majority of the cases, most of my lymphoma patients, they do not carry any risk factors. It is either we, are, we haven't found the cause uh, in current uh, scientific way, 
uh, or they're just a, a, a unknown. Uh, so they are, they are most of the time they are unknown causes. Hopefully, in the future, with more uh, uh, science and, and research, we can have the answer. Thank you very much, uh, Lawrence, uh, for the insights into risk factors for uh, lymphomas. Uh, I move on to an, another question, uh, and this time um, to uh, Ida. I think this is a question that's uh, quite frequently asked by uh, our patients and their relations uh, and their, their relatives, and that's in regards to uh, leukemias. So the question is asked is, is leukemia hereditary? And very similar along those lines, can leukemia be passed to one's children? Uh, Ida, would you like to take that question? Um, thanks, Dong, and, and thanks for the one asking the question. Um, so there are types of uh, inherited conditions that could cause uh, leukemias, but as a whole, they are not very common, although uh, now we are increasingly acknowledging more and more mutations that are actually hereditary. But I, I think as a whole, the incidence, even after acknowledging all these mutations, it's less than 10% of all the leukemias that we treat. Um, so unless the doctors you know, have high suspicion based on history taking and physical exam and some other mutations that they detect in the leukemia, um, I think there should be not so much of a worry that you know, it could be passed on to the children. Thank you, um, uh, Aida, for that uh, insight into uh, whether leukemias can be hereditary. Now, I think there's a fair bit of interest uh, from the section of your talk uh, uh, concerning uh, the use of arsenic and how it is derived from uh, Chinese medicine. So I just take this opportunity just to uh, allow for the answering of a couple of questions in regards to that. Um, the first one, of course, is the, you know, uh, about arsenic being used to treat leukemias. Uh, and the question asked was, wondering, are there other examples of using TCM or Western medicines together to achieve better outcomes in cancer treatment? perhaps in our setting uh, for hematological cancers. Uh, any insights into that? To be honest, I don't know of anything else. So I'm not sure that the Dr. Ng has anything. Okay. But, but sometimes what I do, um, what, what I've advised my patients and they seem to help is that after chemotherapy, uh, they feel that a certain type of PCM may help to boost their, either appetite or energy. Um, I, that, that is something that I encourage them to do if they feel it helps. But during the period of chemotherapy itself, generally our advice is not to combine because there are some concerns that it may lead to uh, interactions. Uh, but if there is you know, any study to show that they may actually be um, you know, synergistic rather than conflicting, uh, I'll definitely uh, propose it to, to, to my patients. Yes, as we seek better understanding of uh... And, and, and more uh, treatment options for our patients. I think that there will be many opportunities to embrace or rather to uh, assimilate uh, both Western as well as uh, Eastern medicine for the management of many of our types of uh, disorders, including patients with cancer. Uh, now in the interest of time, I think we are slightly above, uh, beyond 100 minutes. I will just uh, ask uh, live uh, the answer to one more question. And I'd like us to direct that question to, um, to Denise. And this is a question on uh, a, a very uh, uh, um, simple question. Can myeloproliferative neoplasms be managed with lifestyle modifications? Denise? Okay, um, that's a very uh, in, uh, interesting question. Um, they cannot be treated uh, per se by um, lifestyle modifications. Okay, uh, but Actually, I do, I do believe that uh, lifestyle changes do have a, um, a role to play in the overall management of the condition, especially when it comes to managing symptoms and possibly in some ways to, in preventing progression. Um, and there are some early studies to support this. Um, so, for example, um, you know, a lot of the mutations that we, we develop over time are actually also contributed by generalized inflammation in our body. For example, smoking uh, causes inflammation, smoking results in cancer. Um, there are some studies, not in myeloproliferative neoplasms, but in other types of cancers where um, diets, for example, like a Mediterranean diet that is supposed to uh, decrease inflammation in the body has been, result has been associated with um, decreased rates of cancer. Um, 
uh, in myeloproliferative neoplasms, there is some data that actually yoga as a form of exercise um, can also improve um, the symptoms uh, that I talked about. Um, and also um, meditation, surprisingly, and um, uh, wellness um, activities can also improve uh, well-being of, um, of MPN patients. Um, and I see Dr. Ida nodding. I'm not sure he's nodding there, but I think that this applies really to a lot of, um, a lot of cancers as well. Yeah, not just myeloproliferative neoplasms. Thank you, Denise, for that uh, delightful answer to uh, truly a very interesting uh, and relevant question from uh, the uh, audience. I think with that, it leads me then, of course, to tell you that we have uh, slightly exceeded over 100 minutes uh, of uh, our time uh, for this public forum uh, this uh, afternoon. I hope that over the last uh, um, 100 minutes or, or so, uh, we have been able to provide the audience with uh, some insights, uh, useful information uh, to help um, answer some of the questions that you have, allay some of the concerns that uh, you have over hematological disorders and perhaps uh, open our minds to what uh, hematological conditions there are out there and how amenable they are to modern science in alleviating treating, uh, if not uh, reducing some of the symptoms and side effects of the immunological uh, disorders. And what we will do with some of the questions that have yet to be answered is that uh, the team will uh, stay on uh, after this to try to provide answers for all the questions that you have uh, posed uh, in the Q&A uh, sections. We will certainly do that. And I believe that there will be uh, uh, webinar, this webinar will be streamed and be available for streaming for any of you who may have missed the sections of the uh, webinar. And in closing, I'd like to thank uh, our uh, four speakers, uh, May Ann, uh, Ida, Denise, as well as Lawrence, and as I said in the background, uh, Dr. Tae Hui Min, who has played an important part in putting together this uh, afternoon's um, public forum. And last but not least, we also like to thank the uh, team from the patient liaison office uh, who has been working very hard to uh, put together this public forum. And the very last uh, 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 group of people to thank, of course, is you, uh, members of the audience who have been excellent in your participation, have asked very insightful questions uh, for which we hope that our answers does justice to the enthusiasm uh, and the um, uh, interest that you have uh, in mental disorders. I wish all of you a very good afternoon. And as a uh, usual greeting now is, uh, please uh, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your weekends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend. Stay safe.